So, without further ado, let's turn to our talks for tonight. We have Alexander, Alexander Puy and Yenia Sarusi. And today is going to be a very interesting combination of talks because they're both talking about causality in some way, but t uh, touching on that from totally different angles. And I'm really looking forward to see how these two talks uh, contrast with each other. So, our first speaker, uh, Alex, will talk about catastrophe modeling, which I wouldn't necessarily say that's a core data science topic, but it's, it's really interesting uh, in that he uses a model of how he thinks the world works, the things that bring about catastrophes. <clears throat> And um, this is a causal model of what's actually going on in the world. And he simulates it, he simulates the world, and then he's now talking about how to deal with the uncertainty that's associated with, the, with this model, with these sim the simulations. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hear how you do that in an industry context and how you can make sense of essentially a black box. By means of introduction, Alex is a senior risk analyst at Willis Towers Watson, which is a consulting firm. Prior to this, he uh, worked in the natural perils team at IAG as catastrophe analyst. He has a varied background uh, in law, climate science, and a PhD in applied statistics from UW. And, um, oh, and it just went to sleep. Move over to his talk. He will speak to us today about dealing with uncertainty and catastrophe modeling. Would you like to take this mic or a lapel? Um, I'll take the mic. Beautiful. It's all yours. Uh, give a round of applause to Alex. Thanks, uh, Fabian, for the introduction and for inviting me, uh, including Eileen. Um, and thanks, everyone, for turning up. Um, given the um, depressing headlines in the news recently, Donald Trump, Brexit, ISIS, um, I'm a bit, you know, I wish I could talk about something a little bit more cheerful, but uh, unfortunately uh, my topic is a little bit grim, just catastrophes, right? So, um, nonetheless, well, I have good news. It might not be as elegant as what Fabian talked about, causality and my views of the world, or how the model views the world, but um, I think we're a little bit closer to getting a grip on probabilistic catastrophe risks rather than just putting finger up in the air, right? So uh, why do we care about catastrophes? Um, apart from the obvious toll on uh, human lives and, and impact, um, it's also very costly. It's actually becoming more expensive with time, as you can see um, from uh, this chart over here by Swiss Re. And you can see that the total economic, worryingly as well, the total economic losses are diverging from the total insured losses, which puts additional strain on the financial system and on governments around the world. And also, even though last year was considered to be a benign, a rather benign year um, in terms of catastrophes, um, you can see that there were over a thousand loss events, uh, from ranging from wildfires to floods, storms, earthquakes. So, yeah, so today, I think uh, my intention is to give you um, some ideas about catastrophe modeling uh, from an insurance perspective and from a model user's perspective, importantly. I'll, I'll make that caveat because I think in a couple of week, months or the next few meetups, we'll actually have some model developers that will be talking about it. So why do we perform cat modeling, um, which is industry parlance for catastrophe modeling? How do they work? And how do we interpret catastrophe modeling output? And, more, and importantly, how do we deal with the uncertainty around uh, catastrophes? Because we're looking often at tail risk events, and, and, and that's obviously very uncertain. So from an insurance perspective, um, cat, cat modeling uh, or cat models are used as a tool to understand uh, underlying risk exposure. So the exposure of their property portfolio, for example, to earthquakes, cyclones, floods, and other perils. They're also used to sort of price your premiums, but don't come and look for me if your, your premiums go up. Um, NRMA decides, or Suncorp decides to raise your premiums. 
Um, it's also used to structure and price reinsurance programs because um, the insurers, the primary insurers, they don't always retain all that risk. They often seed some of it out to international reinsurers who are able to further diversify risk away. So the Berkshire Hathaways, Warren Buffetts of the world. Um, it's also used to satisfy capital adequacy requirements. So insurers so behave like banks. I'm, I'm sure there are actuaries in this room as well. So insurers behave like banks in the, in the sense that they do need to allow for these uh, um, you know, tail events. And also more recently, they've also been used uh, to price alternative risk transfer mechanisms. So what do I mean by that? It's like, have, has anyone heard of catastrophe bonds? Yeah. Um, and also insurance linked securities. So basically they use catastrophe bonding output to price a bond which you can buy and if, it, if an earthquake of a certain magnitude happens, it triggers and it, you know, it pays out to the insurer and investors lose all their money. So um, this is just a schematic to show sort of that catastrophe modeling is sort of a framework, can be thought of as a framework that combines all these different areas like science, the data, and, and how buildings respond to catastrophes, so the engineering behind the buildings, looking at claims experience from insurers or loss adjusters, and also complex financial structures. So oftentimes you superimpose um, reinsurance ag agreements or arrangements. Um, you might want to share some of that risk or structure the loss in certain ways. So catastrophe modeling um, in its current form provides a good platform for doing that. So in the past, before probabilistic catastrophe modeling came about, uh, the actuaries basically just used historical claims experience, which, uh, you know, because of uh, a lack of data, uh, because these events are so infrequent, they were not able to get a, a, a sort of more holistic grapple of, of, the, of the full loss distribution. So today, I believe we've, we've moved one step further. So I'm just going to talk about the key model components. So every catastrophe model is different, um, but they do seem to have these different key components to them. So for example, the first one being the hazard. So generating event sets, um, as, as Fabian talked about, simulating many of these, uh, what they call a stochastic catalog of, for example, cyclone tracks or earthquake occurrences. And the next one is the vulnerability piece. So how do, how do buildings respond to a peak wind gust of say, you know, 80 kilometers per hour or something like that. And then finally, what is the cost given the damage? How do we translate the damage of a building into financial costs? So I'll start with the hazard. Um, on the left here, you can see simulated hurricane tracks. That's just a visual um, uh, of land falling hurricanes in the um, east coast of the United States. And on the right, you can see that it's a simulated earthquake events. And this one's actually pretty interesting. Recall that I spoke about uh, catastrophe bonds earlier. So this one's actually taken from a catastrophe bond graphic where you can see that although there's a cluster of uh, earthquakes happening there, they're not really triggering because there's not much, you know, there are not many cities down there in San Jose is over there. This is actually Mexico. So you can see that the ones that triggered were a lot closer to where, uh, you know, eco economic footprints are. So over, now that you've simulated all these events, what happens next is that each event uh, is, uh, will be plotted along this uh, vulnerability function here. So as you can see on the y-axis is something called the mean damage ratio, and on the x-axis here it's just shown to be wind speed, but it could be peak ground acceleration or it could be a flood that, depending on the peril. And then uh, these damage functions are derived by the model developers. And also importantly, um, note that it's called the mean damage ratio because there's uncertainty around the mean as well. So two buildings, for example, two buildings might be identical in features, but maybe the contractor or the builder had a bad day and didn't nail the roof down properly from one building to the next. So therefore, you get, <coughs> although you have the same forcing event, you might get a difference in the response of the building right, to this forcing. So then what happens after that, it's, uh, this is very high level, by the way. So what happens is you get a probability of loss where you multiply the damage ratio, which is from 0 to 1, 1 meaning full damage, um, with the building's uh, replacement value. So how much does it cost to rebuild that building? Yeah, and you get a probability of loss. I'll talk about uncertainty a bit in more detail later, 
but here's just to give you the, the basics so you get a better appreciation uh, for the model components and hopefully they'll, they'll aid you in your understanding of the uncertainty and how it permeates through the model. So just to illustrate, um, different buildings have different responses to different perils. That's a, that's a mouthful. But here on the left we have a wood frame and on the right we've got a masonry. Anyone able to guess what, what building that is? Excellent. Well, no, pick the right one. So, for example, if we have a hypothetical cyclone with a certain you know, peak wind gust, the wood frame obviously won't stand up to that forcing as well as the masonry building. However, um, you see that the damage functions look very different when it comes to earthquake, where because of uh, the wood frame allows for uh, lateral uh, movements of the ground shaking, whereas the masonry building actually does not um, perform as well. So just to give you an idea that you know these are coded, all these properties of the building are coded in your input data into the model. Yeah? And, um, and it's fed into the model and, and therefore you get very different results if you do not. Um, here I'll take an aside and talk about data uncertainty, but if let's say your data is not correct, rubbish in, rubbish out. So finally we talk about um, financial loss, but also um, losses across different locations, right? So in an insurance context, um, hoping that your portfolio consists of more than one building. So I mean, normally it's uh, how do you account, then account for the loss distribution across several buildings. So this is another idealized example where you use convolutions to combine the loss distribution from, so let's say, um, this portfolio just has two buildings and they've got different loss profiles. And how do you combine it? It's pretty simple. You, you just add up all the prob, um, all the permutations or the combinations to get to your probability of, say, getting a loss of 10 million for this event. And it's interesting to know that in this example, I'll probably speculate that if this uh, peril was cyclone, you will um, you will see that on the left uh, upper right upper left box there, it's more fairly in a strong uniform distribution, whereas on the right um, it's sort of going this way. It's got a skew, and if it's cyclone, this property here might be a lot further away from the coast than that property. Therefore, the you know assuming they're of equal value, there's a much lower chance of getting a total loss. Okay, because wind speeds tend to decrease uh, with distance from coast. So um, on to catastrophe modeling output. How do we interpret these? What's, what's being spit out by the model, essentially? So um, here we're looking at return period losses. So a return period loss is like what is your one in a hundred year loss, which is not uh, for any given year. So it's an inverse of that will be what's your exceedance probability, okay? And if you look at this um, catalog here, highly idealized catalog of only 10 years, and you see a loss distribution, um, the losses for each year, you can plot an empirical, um, so this is a discrete case, so a mass function here, and then you can see each year has a you know, loss of 0 0.1 um, probability. So therefore, uh, and you, after you rank them, you can see that your exceedance probability for one in, uh, or one in a 10 year return period is 99, uh, loss of 99 million or greater. So another statistic is the average ammo loss. <coughs> this can be uh, likened to the expected value um, of the loss distribution. So here I picked earthquake uh, as an example. So uh, you can see that the expected loss is basically just the loss multiplied by the probability of loss and you sum it across every event. And interestingly, I picked earthquake and hurricane because uh, of the different shape of the, uh, um, the curve, if you like. So although we have identical uh, average annual losses there, just mind the difference in the scale, you get a very different exceedance probability curve shape. Right? So this is, this is quite interesting because hurricane by its nature is more frequent and less intense as a peril relative to earthquake, which is very infrequent but when it does happen especially in a place like Australia, it's very, very intense. So you get a very steep curve shape. So just to formalize that, here are the applications of uh, model output. So if you've got exceedance probability, it could be either, normally in insurance, we either call it occurrence uh, exceedance probability, which is the largest event for the year, or 
aggregate exceedance or aggregate annual exceedance probability, which is the summation of all your loss events for that year. And the area under the curve or the expected value as we talked about, um, average annual loss, it feeds into that um, point I talked about with premiums before. Um, also understanding the key drivers of loss because if you're combining more than one peril together, if you're looking at cyclone, earthquake, you can get a feel for what, what's really driving your loss for that portfolio. And a lot of that will depend on what sort of buildings you're underwriting or where, where those buildings are, right? Um, probable maximum loss applications, sorry, didn't put, um, didn't put the wording there, but um, that's used for, typically used for pricing of uh, reinsurance, so we are focusing more towards the tail here of the distribution, and also for capital adequacy requirements as stipulated by APRA. So in Australia, APRA requires us to hold um, or insurers to hold, I'm not an insurer now, so to hold <laughs> well, up to one in 200 years, um, uh, typically, and, um, and that's the view that's informed by the model. It might be supplemented by in-house views as well. Um, but in New Zealand, for example, for earthquake, they're requiring, uh, RBNZ requires uh, New Zealand insurers to hold up to one in a thousand years. So, I'll, I'll defer that to the model developers to talk more about it because uh, they're, they're really across that. And um, what happens after the uh, probable maximum loss, um, if we're looking really at the tail now, what's uh, a handy statistic is called the tail conditional expectation, or oh, I think this uh, is quite similar to the tail value at risk in finance, in the finance world, so it's expected loss given that a loss as large as the, return, uh, the probable maximum loss has occurred. So this really helps to understand more the drivers of tail risk because we don't know where the distributions, uh, whether it's flattened up or whether it's very heavy tail. So moving on to uncertainty now, um, in, a, in a very philosophical perspective, I think uncertainty can be broken down into epistemic and aleatory uncertainty. So epistemic refers to limits of our knowledge, limits of or limits of science. Right? Um, and it's also due to the limited historical record and what we can observe from the past. Aleatory, uh, in, I think in Latin means games of chance or dice, so that's intrinsic randomness that is often irreducible. Yeah, in catastrophe modeling world, um, it is often uh, more convenient to represent it as primary or secondary uncertainty. So primary uncertainty is more focused on the hazard generation component, so is a Poisson uh, process a good way to model earthquakes, for example. We need to in, in assume independence, but is that assumption uh, you know, adequate, for example? Um, or even parameters that govern the cyclone path. Should we use a random walk process or um, a mod, uh, uh, Markov chain using historical transition probabilities? Um, these are questions that are more directed, again, at the model developers, but it's something that, as model users, we need to know. What was the you know, inputs, uh, what, what was, how was this model sort of built? And a uh, secondary component is more focused on vulnerability, as I've talked about before. It's more like at site or the damage functions that are applied. So I think um, in Queensland, they've got something called the cyclone testing station, where they actually subject in a real envir live environment, um, you know, buildings to different wind speeds, or even at a uh, water research lab in Manly, um, at a hydraulics lab, I know they do a lot of flow or storm surge testing. And I think uh, we had a you know, live example in Colorado not, not too long ago. <laughs> so here's examples of primary and secondary uncertainty. Um, this just shows um, uh, peak ground acceleration uh, decaying or um, propagating to, uh, with distance away from the source of the earthquake. So you can see there's some uncertainty as it decays. Uh, whereas for secondary uncertainty, um, here I'm just using an example provided by a model vendor called RMS. Um, the Florida residential wood frame, so when they did their tests, you can see that at low peak wind gusts, there was a lot of scatter around. So some buildings fell over, others didn't. But when you move towards really high wind speeds, the chances of them, uh, of these buildings failing were a lot uh, more consistent. And, and that's quite intuitive. So how do you combine uncertainty in different parts, from different parts of the model, right? So in a nutshell, 
Um, let's say we've got hazard uncertainty. We are not very sure about the peak wind gust. So there's some kind of distribution around there. <coughs> Excuse me. And then when you sample one of these, you will get, um, as I talked about before, damage ratio distribution for each um, mean wind speed, right? Uh, so mean damage ratio along here. And when you combine both of them, if you do this many times, you will actually come up, uh, it's mathematically expressed as the integral here, but you come up with an overall damage ratio with a certain standard deviation and a mean uh, damage ratio here. So this is express, expressed uh, in RMS as a coefficient of variation, which is basically just your standard deviation divided by the mean damage ratio. And uh, if you go back here, just think about this chart for a little while. You can see that as the mean uh, damage ratio goes up, so as the events, uh, you know, as the wind gets stronger, the building is more likely to fail, and there's more certainty that we'll know that it'll fail. So the coefficient of variation goes down. So there's less uncertainty with very, very big events. Um, another big source of uncertainty comes from spatial correlations. So this has everything to do with where your portfolio is and how you know, everyone talks about diversifying, you know, in space uh, as to the portfolio. If we have um, the location losses are perfectly correlated, then coefficients one, and you can just sum them up that way. And if they are perfectly uncorrelated, it becomes an orthogonal sort of addition here. And how they've treated it uh, in some catastrophe models is they've just looked at the weights, um, you know, um, based on how tightly or how well distributed the portfolios are. So they call this geoconcentration of the portfolio. So now, how do we actually express all that uncertainty we talked about um, in the results? So how is it actually exported to, to the user, for the user, right? So for example, here we've got a return period loss of 675 million, and you've got two events that we're looking at right here. So that's the mean loss from the event, and there's an uncertainty around it. So that portion will be contributing to the return period loss. Whereas for this event, the mean loss is actually larger than 75 million, and therefore you expect more of that event to be contributing. So it's actually expressed in an event list table where um, just here, just using five events as an example, you've got the annual rates for each event, and you've got um, these characteristics here, and the alpha and beta actually are the parameters for the beta distribution. So here they've used, this model vendor has elected to use the beta distribution to characterize the uncertainty around it. And I think um, they've used beta because it's very convenient. It, it's, the domain goes from zero to one, which matches the, the loss ratio of zero to one. And also it can mimic a whole range of distributions by just tweaking the parameters. And after that, you see the contribution of each event, which is the rate multiplied by that, to get the exceedance rate. And then you get a sum product. Once you get a sum product of that, you get the exceedance, overall exceedance rate, which then, that's just like a simple CDF formula, to get the overall exceedance probability for that event. Uh, for that loss, sorry. So now that we've talked about all the different sources of uncertainty, uh, how do we address it? So if you're just going in blind, one way, you know, and I think this is where the data science really, or data scientists can really help, is uh, by, you know, just basically doing some bootstrapping, very simple, of the event list table. Like going back, if we've got thousands of these events, you plot, you know, you choose some, and then you form um, the sampling distribution around it. And um, another way of doing it could be um, actually mixing these models. So it's quite eloquent eloquently for model blending. So uh, there might be a few model vendors out there, including Risk Frontiers, just sitting over there, and, um, and you're not sure which model to pick. So you might have different reasons for, for picking certain models, but if you want a, whole, a more holistic view, you could uh, reduce model risk or reliance on a single model by blending. And these blends will sometimes diversify away the independent imperfections from the model, but it could also introduce uh, more uh, you know, uncertainty. So you've got to be very careful. So for example, there are two main ways or simple ways of blending it. Um, 
the most common and one that I've seen is severity blending. So say we've got two models, model A and model B, and you want to do a 50-50 blend of these models. Um, if you inform, let's say, you're at a 400-year return period, which is this thing here, if you have a greater chance that the true one, if you believe that the uh, one in 400-year loss is below B, model B, but above model A, then the blend would sort of make your new view less strong than if you were to rely on uh, um, any of the models in isolation. All right? And another way of doing uh, the blending would be frequency blending. So this is a little bit more uh, involved, but essentially you just mix the events list tables or you combine the event list tables from both of these models to come up with, um, you, you take the problem, you view it another way and you say what is the likelihood of each model spitting out a loss of uh, X amount, all right, over here. And then you, you do that uh, simulation to get a, a new return period, all right? So here, you're not really trusting the frequencies of the model. And in the previous example, you're more, uh, you know, you had reason to question the severity distributions of the model, all right? So here, if you just look at that formula here, um, you can see that there's a lot of, it, it does invoke a somewhat a Bayesian approach to things where these uh, probabilities here are, are like the priors. And a, a neat thing about frequency blending is you do preserve a lot of the characteristics from the event sets, such as correlations and the structures, which would then be fed into capital models for the actuaries, whereas for severity blending, that does not hold. So um, other methods, there, there are many ways to sort of uh, look at uncertainty, I suppose. And, and one way that I've seen is sensitivity testing of the assumptions. So how sensitive are the models to, for example, uh, building time, the codes, number of stories, or even some models where you don't have enough granular information about where your risks actually sit. Then you have postcode information where they aggregate all the exposures within the postcode and then you let the model vendors do the disaggregation themselves. And how does the model treat that? Uh, historical event validation is a convenient one. So, for example, um, Christchurch earthquake is a good example where a lot of the models came very, uh, very much under, um, you know, uh, depending on the true return period of the Christchurch loss. A lot of the models were underestimating the loss. So, why was that um, the case? Was it because of, um, you know, their treatment of that underlying hazard, or was it more towards the vulnerability functions? Or was it other perils such as liquefaction that they did not allow or did not allow adequately for? And obviously, we do uh, consult with the model vendors quite often. Uh, every time they have model updates, or every any time we, if we find something strange happening within the model, we'll, we'll tend to consult the model vendors. Yeah, and um, yeah, bias correction methods as well. If you see that models are systematically underestimating or overestimating loss, um, you can also. Uh, correct accordingly and scale for it. So it's this law of subjectivity is, is I think, the, the, the answer to that. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's it for now. Are there any questions, Alex? We have mics so that people at the other end of the room have a chance of hearing you as well. Um, thanks for the nice talk. Um, how do we evaluate or validate these, these models? I think it's related to your last slide. Could you elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, so um, it's a very good question. Validation um, in this space uh, can, can take many forms, right? So I think you're right that normally uh, a convenient, a good place to start will be just historical events because it's easy. It's a scenario-based uh, evaluation. So, for example, um, Cyclone Yazi caused X amount of loss. But from the catalog, the stochastic event list catalog, there's an event that really closely, uh, that looks like the track of Cyclone Yazi. has the same parameters, the wind speed, central pressure. You take that event out, and then you run it on the port volume. Um, you know. So, for example, if you're writing the entire thing, uh, all the properties there, they'll, you'll typically use an inch. The, what they call a, a industry exposure database, right? And you run it there and you see how, you know, that's one way of, one convenient way of evaluating. And also, you can evaluate the science behind some of these models. 
because some models differ uh, because there's there's still uncertainty, like I say, epistemic uncertainty, right? And a good example would be earthquake in Perth, right? So some models will spit out a very uh, different result, a very much larger result, because the attenuations functions that they use uh, are different from other models, and there might be scientific reasoning that's still in debate. So the way uh, the, the waves propagate through the yoga and Kraton. So I'm not a science being expert, but I know that's been a moot point, for example. But I think validation is not coming up with answers. It's just showing and demonstrating that you've critically analyzed the model instead of just taking it as a black box uh, entirely and, and, and also engaging very closely with the model vendors. Because I think they, they walk a very tight road uh, between giving away too much IP and, and also you know making sure that the models are used correctly and all. There's such a thing, fitness for purpose, right? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for the great talk. That's fascinating. Now, could you just elaborate a bit on um, simulation and what form simulation takes? Like, are you like creating massive virtual worlds and like running data sets through it? Like, what forms of simulation is that? Yeah, so basically, simulation, I think the model vendors uh, will be able to answer this in a lot greater detail. From, but for, from my perspective, basically, a simulation is. It could take the form of historical uh, cycle tracks, for example. <coughs> Where were they forming? Um, how, how, what process do you use to model them, for example? And, and it might come down to even something really simple like a statistical treatment. Um, you know, in bushfire, I know that some models, they just use a statistical treatment because the, 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 you know, the dynamics or the physics behind bushfire propagation are so complex, right? But we see certain things that are unique to bushfire as well, such as uh, the loss ratios tend to be either one or zero. It tends to be very binary. Either your house is burnt or it's still standing. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think that, that's my very abbreviated answer to that. Yes, yeah, so um, just before you mentioned about not wanting to give away any IP, um, but over the course of your talk, you mentioned the word model about 100 times. I'm just wondering if you could shed any light on how do you produce this model? Is it just like an empirically derived formulae based on this stuff? Is yeah. it like some kind of algorithm? Or? Yeah, that, that's why I think I, I need to make it very clear at this point that uh, the mo uh, I'm not, I do not represent the model vendors. I'm a model user. So basically I represent the firms that license these models and run these models, right? But we try to know as much as we can about the models themselves. And, and I think that's really a question that should be directed at um, uh, the model vendors, I know some of them are here tonight, so um, I'll, I'll refer it to them. But that's a good question. It's something that I always ask as well. I just have one more. Uh, I think it's very similar to this one. I've never heard of a model vendor before, I'm not from insurance. So, whoops. Um, I was just wondering, when you get a model from a model vendor, is it just given to you as a black box and then you go through the validation? Or just, like, what do you know about it? Great question, Sarah. Um, yeah, that, that actually, the model vendors typically are, for example, in the insurance world, right? There are three internationally recognized model vendors, such as RMS, Risk Management Solutions, AIR, and EQECAT. But domestically, we also have uh, model vendors uh, that produce, uh, called Risk Frontiers from Macquarie University, that supplement those commercial uh, vendors' view. So um, they typically come with uh, info packs, for example, but it's sort of the onus is on you, the model user, to sort of do a whole range of stress tests, sensitivity tests, to see whether the behavior of the model is in line with what you know they think is reasonable. And a lot of these decisions uh, are also, I, I think you, you can't just look at the technical uh, risk in isolation because there are also commercial realities to it as well. Yeah. So for example, like your premiums, if your premiums are to go up and down, from year to year because they decided that, okay, a Poisson distribution is not the right way of doing it. Maybe it's showing clustering or over dispersion behavior. So maybe we'll, we'll tack on a negative binomial, for example, right? Or, you know, El Nino or La Nina is coming. So therefore we expect greater bushfire, greater flood risk. But that doesn't mean your premiums are going up and down every year. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I understand that prior to the Fukushima disaster, there was at least one scientist who insisted that the seawall was not nearly high enough for a one in a 200 year event, but he was uh, uh, talked down by people who insisted that the one in 200 years event would be much smaller than what actually came along. 
So I was wondering if you happened down the inside of that, was it more science and politics or more politics than science? Yeah, um, apart from commercial reality, I think that politics do play a part in this as well. And, and, and thanks for that question, it's a, it's a really good question. Unfortunately, I, we, I do not have experience with the Japanese um, earthquakes and I have not run exposure or used Japanese models, uh, I mean Japanese earthquake models before. But what, what I can say, I think uh, there's, a, there's a really nice article in Financial Times recently uh, that explores uh, the possibility of uh, the Nankai Trough um, actually, uh, you know, because of the stress and strain, the time dependency that I talked about before. Because a lot of these models assume it independent, that if one earthquake happens, it's not going to impact the likelihood of the next earthquake or the timing and the magnitude of the next earthquake. So uh, I, I'll refer you to that article. Uh, I'll I would have one more as well. Yes, I would have one more question. You said the the data scientists come in handy when you talk about when you try to blend yes. different models, and it's all a bit like in the validation part, they might uh, it might be there might be scope for some new approaches as well. Do you where do you see the next few years going in that regard? Is there Will your industry change a lot? Yeah, yeah. I think I think um, again the model man vendors will have a view on this. But then my view is that I think data scientists have a great role to play in this. I mean, uh, it's a great opportunity for data scientists to come into this space because I think models are getting more transparent these days. There's more regular regulatory pressure to validate the models, and also uh, some of the model vendors are actually uh, becoming sort of hosting platforms. Um, so that anyone, not anyone, but people who, or, or other, other newcomers can come in. It's easier to sort of enter the market, if you like. Yeah. And, and also, basically, the, these more, uh, and use the platform of the model vendors to sort of um, build their own, so to speak. So, so just, just to, just to uh, sort of elaborate a bit more on that, I think, it's, it's quite interesting that the biggest, oh, not the biggest, one of the leading models um, that we use today in the insurance industry actually came out of someone's master's thesis. So that's, you know, um, ignoring everything else, it, it actually just comes from a good idea. Yeah, so data scientists are more than welcome. To, uh, How do you know the model is good? How do you know the model is good? It's being used. can evaluate it. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, we, we can evaluate mm -hmm. it, but to a certain extent. Yeah, we don't get full visibility. Like I said, it's still a black box, and it's being, you know, it's no excuse, but it's being used by the entire industry. So, you know, there, there's, there, are, you know, these uh, commercial realities that have to be accounted for. What one more? I was just going to ask, um, how, obviously, insurance brokers and insurance fund <coughs> companies they make quite a bit of money. Generally, um, Warren Buffett loves the industry as well, but there have been some big problems, should I say, and you could argue some of that has been down to politics, as mentioned before. But I was just wondering, obviously they make a profit margin, they make quite a bit of profit out of this. Do you know how successful they've been in predicting these events, given the extra inputs in more complicated scientific models and that sort of aspect is the maths helping, or is are we sort of, sort of broadly looking at okay, this is what occurred previously, and this is the maximum damage we'd expect it to, or is that sort of you put more detail in? I know you don't build the models, but giving yeah. you more success in predictive power, or is it just a sort of case of the models help, but we still have to fall back on a wide confidence interval, for example. Yeah, I think, I think when you're looking at terrorists, unfortunately, the confidence intervals are always never tight enough, right? Um, but it's an excellent question again. Um, I think there's been something called model, uh, the co a convergence in the views of, of different models, because when models uh, you know, are too far apart, the industry sort of provides a market sort of view for that. Um, but whether that market view was right or not, I think, um, I think the, the, t the testament that the industry has not suffered, you know, uh, you know, the likes of Swiss Re, Warren Buffett, the fact that they're still in business and operating is testament to their resilience, I think, um, that, that they're still in, 
they're still basically operating despite the large losses. And arguably, they're getting a better handle on the risk um, than before because they, they do this through underwriting selection uh, you know, and using the help of the model. So I, I would say yes. So diversifying your portfolio according to uh, help uh, given by, provided by the models. Make this the last question for this round. Uh, yep. In terms of using this model, is it only for the APRA requirements in terms of deciding how much capital should we keep, or do the insurance companies also base their strategies on pricing based on the output? Yeah, yeah. The insurance, uh, the re insurance, both the insurance and the uh, primary insurers and the reinsurers use catastrophe models, to my knowledge. I mean, um, if you are really good predictor, you could. Just forget about all the catastrophe models and say that oh, I, I have a crystal ball and I can predict it. And if you can convince APRA that that's your best tool, then, then good luck. You know? but, but I think in this day and age, it's at, at the very least, it's used as a tool to supplement your overall view of risk, your best view of risk. Uh, obviously, you've got claims experience and you have, like, like I said before, everyone will have their own view of whether the model um, is erring on the high or the low side, for example. Yeah. Okay, please join me in thanking Alex for this presentation. Hi, my name's Greg Capel. I'm a data science search specialist um, focused on the fintech startup space, so it's quite interesting that you got up and, and, and started talking about that. Um, I'm wearing two hats, one with a company which is a VC organisation called Reinventure and also my own company which is Fintech Search. So if your knees inspired you about the startup space and what you can do with modelling and move away from probably large corporates, please come and talk to me. I'll be over on the right hand side. Thank you.